Good evening and welcome to this 30 minute revision webinar looking at psychopathology with Tutor to You. Uh, to start with, uh, with just four days to go to your exam, we hope you find that there's a lot of useful material in this particular webinar and lots of things that could come up in your exam in just four days time. So best of luck with that exam. Okay. To start with, we're going to look at the sample papers and see if we can tell anything about uh, this section of the exam from the sample material that's been published by AQA. Remember, these are merely guesses, but they might provide some insight to what your real exam could look like. Um, the first thing that's definitely worth noting is that every one of the sample questions has had an essay in it, okay? either an 8 or a 12 mark essay, uh, and this gives us a high probability that an essay might appear in the real exam as well. In addition to that, highlighted in orange on the screen, you'll see there's an awful lot of AO2 application questions for this part of the course. Um, psychopathology really lends itself to some application questions, and therefore it makes sense for them to include quite a lot in this particular section. So do watch out for those, and we'll cover quite a lot in this session. Uh, four key aims for today. We're going to revise the definitions of abnormality and apply these to some AO2 application questions. We're then going to revise the behaviour, emotional and cognitive characteristics for OCD, phobias and depression and try and give you some techniques to help you remember those different characteristics. Then we're going to move on to look at how psychopathology can affect the economy because we're looking to expect an economy question in this exam. And then lastly, we're going to look at the psychopathology essays and see if we can come up with some nice, easy ways that we can evaluate different types of essay in this part of the course, very much like we did yesterday. Um, so to start with, with all the definitions of abnormality, what we're looking at is how can we explain someone is abnormal? So if we start with statistical infrequency, according to this definition, you're abnormal if your behaviour is statistically uncommon in the top or bottom 2.5% of the population. Now there are some issues with this, uh, with this particular definition. The first one is that of misdiagnosis. Common problems can quite often go undiagnosed with this particular, with this particular definition. So if we take for example depression, depression is actually quite a common psychological disorder, certainly more than 2.5% of the population, therefore people with depression will be deemed as normal using this definition. On the other hand, a really good thing about this definition is its objective. It's very easy for psychological practitioners to diagnose someone either with or without an illness according to this definition. There's a clear cut-off point for abnormality, which is good. The second de definition, deviation from social norms. According to this definition, you're abnormal if your behaviour violates unwritten rules in a particular culture or society. Okay. Now, a negative thing about this uh, this particular sort of definition is something called cultural relativism. What is normal in one culture might not be normal in another and therefore actually this definition can sort of be abusive of human rights because what is deemed as normal in the UK, for example homosexuality, might be seen as abnormal elsewhere and just because it violates the rules of that society people might deem it as an abnormal behaviour. On the other hand, though, it does take into account what we call situational norms. Maybe some behaviours aren't actually appropriate in certain contexts, and therefore it does take into account those behaviours depending upon the place, the society and the time, which is a good thing. Third definition is failure to function adequately. Now, according to this definition, you're unable to cope with the demands of everyday life, and it must interfere with either your social or your occupational well-being, and we'll see this in a moment in this particular webinar. Now, again, we get the issue of misdiagnosis because with this definition, for a slightly different reason, two people might have exactly the same symptoms but get a different diagnosis depending upon whether uh, their symptoms affect their everyday life. On the other hand, a really good thing, and following on from that, is that actually it does take into account the sort of subjective personal experiences of the person themselves. So if a person, for example, had OCD, but they can function quite normally in everyday life, then actually they wouldn't be abnormal. So the subjective element here is actually a good thing. The final definition, deviation from ideal mental health, says you're abnormal if you don't meet one of Jihada's principles for ideal mental health. There are six of these. I don't advise learning all six. Um, I'd remember a couple of them. One of them is self actualization second environmental mastery, and we need to be resistant to stress. Now, one of the issues with this, uh, this particular definition is that it's a very unrealistic set of criteria. How many of us have actually self-actualised? Can we always resist stress? And is it really possible to achieve all of these different principles? On the other hand, it is the only definition of abnormality which actually takes a positive outlook. Rather than saying you're abnormal if you don't meet something, according to this definition, you're, you're normal if you do meet these criteria. So it takes a more positive and holistic nature. So those are our four definitions. Let's try and now apply them to this question here. So it says here that Bina has been diagnosed with depression. Her doctor says that depression is a common problem, but Bina is just miserable. She cannot be bothered to get washed in the morning, and her manager is unhappy with her taking a lot of time off work. When she does go to work, she's irritable, has temper tantrums, and is rude to customers. 
The question that goes to that, using your knowledge of these three definitions of abnormality, explain whether or not Bina's behaviour might be considered as abnormal. Six marks, so a big question. I always recommend that you must apply to the STEM, in this case, BINA and the definitions of abnormality. That's really, really important. And I always recommend that you highlight extracts from the STEM that you're going to quote in your answer. OK, so let's do that together. We know what some of the definitions are, so let's pick one of those definitions. We might say statistical infrequency is a definition we're going to try and use here. So what we need to look for in the extract is something that suggests that either depression is or isn't common. Fortunately, as I've highlighted at the top there, you'll see that her doctor says depression is a common problem. The second part of the question, it says explain whether or not Bina's behaviour should be considered abnormal according to that definition. So here's how we want, might write that answer. So we might say according to the statistical infrequency definition, a person is abnormal if their behaviour is uncommon. I've defined it. However, quote, depression is a common problem. I've quoted that from the extract. Therefore, under this definition, should be classed as normal. We then do the same. We need to move on and do two more because it's asking us to three. So we might take failure to function adequately. If we look through the extract again, we'll see that she's taking a lot of time off work. That allows us to apply this really nicely. So according to the FFA, failure to function adequately, a person is abnormal if they're unable to cope with the demands of everyday life, work or their social life is impaired. In this case, it's clearly her work. As Bina, quote again, is taking a lot of time off work, she would be classed abnormal according to this definition. Okay, so we've answered that second part. Is she normal or abnormal according to that definition? Last but not least, deviation from social norms. Uh, she has temper tantrums and is rude to customers. Now, according to this definition for, uh, from social norms, a uh, deviation from social norms, a person is abnormal if their behaviour violates unwritten rules in society. Now, having temper tantrums and being rude to people does go against what is socially acceptable, and again, therefore, we would call it abnormal according to this definition. So you can see how we've quoted directly from the extract, and that's helped us to answer this question, apply our knowledge, and get into the effective mark band, getting top marks on this question. Moving on, second part, what I want to look at today is the characteristics of OCD, phobias and depression. And in particular, you need to be able to differentiate between behaviour, emotion and cognitive characteristics. So let's start with OCD. Now, fortunately, if we look at OCD, actually the key is in the name where, where these different characteristics come from. So obsessive um, or obsessions, which is what it's really saying, are the cognitive characteristic. They're forbidden faults. We're thinking about something which often cause anxiety. So obsessions are your cognitive characteristic. Compulsions or compulsive behaviours, because that's what they are, are repetitive behaviours which are used to reduce the anxiety. So that's our behavioural component. And you'll see I put that a B next to it there. Last but not least, OCD stands for Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, but many people with OCD go on to develop depression because the high level of anxiety they experience coming from the compulsions often leads to depression. So depression is the emotional symptom that goes with it. So we can use the three letters just to help us remember, and it's quite nice to do it in that way. Now let's look at how that might appear in a question. Okay, So another AO2, lots of AO2 questions here. Gavin describes his daily life. He says, I sometimes get gripped with the thought that my family is in danger. In particular, I worry about them being trapped in a house fire, and I now find that I can only calm myself if I check that every plug socket is switched off so an electrical fire couldn't start. I used to switch the socket on and off, but now I have to press the switch six times, and it takes me ages to leave my house. It then says, outline two characteristics of OCD and refer to Gavin in your answer. Only four marks, so a shorter question this one. Again, same principles apply as before. You must apply to the STEM, in this case Gavin and the definitions of abnormality, and you must highlight the extract and pick out the key information that you might use in this question. Uh, sorry, applying to OCD, of course, in this case. Now, if we think about the characteristics and how we might refer them, I've put the sort of definitions at the bottom just to help remind us. Um, we've got to talk about the obsessions first of all, the obsession. Clearly in the extract it says he worries about sort of being trapped in a house fire. He worries about his family being trapped in a house fire. So we might answer this by saying obsessions are persistent or forbidden thoughts that often cause anxiety. For example, worrying about your family being trapped in a house fire. Okay, we think we've done the first one. We then move on to compulsion. That's another characteristic. Here we might say compulsions are repetitive behaviours often used to reduce anxiety. Gavin would switch the socket on and off six times. Okay. Not a bad answer to that question, but if we was to consider how many marks that question might be awarded, it's actually not going to be in the top mark band because we're missing kind of really key components. Because if we think about obsessions, they're persistent or forbidden faults. And the answer we've given here hasn't mentioned anything really in our quote about them being persistent or forbidden faults. Likewise, if we think about the compulsions, the key to compulsions is they're there to reduce anxiety. So although it would appear that we've actually applied our knowledge to the question, we haven't said how that reduces anxiety. 
what you'll note in the extract I've actually picked up some other bits that we would need to quote in our answer because the fact that he says he gets gripped is linked to his obsessions and the fact that this is the only thing that can calm him through the compulsions is what is uh, helping him to reduce the anxiety and we need to include that key information so this is not a great answer although we've quoted quite nicely it certainly wouldn't get us into that top mark there so let's think about how we might write that again then. So if we think about the obsessions, what we want to get in there is the fact that he's gripped and he worries about this house fire, okay? So we need to put a bit more in there. So this time around, I've said obsessions are persistent thoughts that often cause anxiety. For example, Gavin is often gripped, showing that it's persistent, with thoughts, for example, worrying about his family being trapped, okay? I've shown there that this is a persistent thought, a key component of the obsession. I'm going to do exactly the same thing this time for the compulsions, okay? Making sure I quote much, much more in my extract. So compulsions are repetitive behaviour often used to reduce anxiety. Gavin would switch every socket on and off six times in order to calm himself. So this time I've added that tiny bit more and he uses this repetitive behaviour to reduce his anxiety, okay? This is what's going to get us the four marks, okay? I'll get us into that top mark band. So it's really important, especially with OCD, you think about actually what are the obsessions there for? What are the compulsions there for? Okay, so do bear that in mind. Okay, looking at a slightly different application question now, one where you can't really quote from the extract because there's not an awful lot in the extract to quote from. So it should be slightly more straightforward. Researchers have analysed the behaviour of over 4,000 pairs of twins. The results showed that the degree to which OCD is inherited is between 45 and 65%. Okay? With reference to the uh, study described above, what do the results seem to show about the possible influences on the development of OCD? Again, another four mark application question. Now, you must apply to the STEM again. In this case, there's not an awful lot to apply to. So in terms of highlighting the extract, there's only really one key thing we can pick out here, and that's the percentages that they've mentioned, the 45 and the 65%. So let's think about how we might put those into our answer this time. Now, the results of this study seem to suggest that OCD, and it's really like, important that you put this word in there, are partly inherited, okay? It's not 100%, so because if one twin has OCD, there's only a 45 to 65% chance that the other twin will also have OCD. Really important you use the word partly. If you said OCD is inherited, you'd be wrong on that. It's partly inherited. That, at this stage, would only really get us two marks because we're not saying, well, where does the rest of OCD come from? So what we have to do here is say, however, as the concordance rate, really lovely key word here, so concordance rate is just the percentage rate in twins, is not 100%, there must be other factors involved in the development of OCD, and we must give an example here. For example, it could be environmental factors such as different friends, media influences that account for this other 35 to 45 percent. Okay, so it's really important that we do the sort of small bit of maths there and quote the different extracts in there. That itself again will be enough to get us into the top mark there. Okay, moving on to phobias. So a different way to try and help you remember these uh, cognitive, behavioural and emotional characteristics of phobias, okay? Um, so if you spell the word phobias out, actually each letter is one of the sort of key ideas from phobias. So the P you could remember as panic, which is an emotional symptom. The H, high levels of stress and anxiety, that's a behavioural symptom. Uh, the O, the fear is often out of proportion to the reality. So if you're scared of spiders, actually your fear often is the case, if you're phobia, if you have a phobia of spiders, is actually out of proportion to the, the object itself. The spiders aren't that dangerous, especially in the UK, so that fear is out of proportion. Uh, B, beliefs which are irrational and irrational fear, so the I links into that, and that's another cognitive and emotional characteristic. The A stands for avoidance, which is another behavioural characteristic, and the S, selective attention. People tend to direct their attention towards these objects, which is another cognitive characteristic. So a nice easy way to sort of remember those key different words from phobias. Now this time I want to look at an application question, but not on phobias itself, on the treatment of phobias. So let's take a look at this one together. So Tommy is six years old and has a phobia about birds. His mother is worried because he now refuses to go outside. She says Tommy used to love playing in the garden and going to the park and play football with his friends, but he's spending more and more time watching TV uh, on the computer. Psychologists have suggested treating Tommy's fear of birds using systematic desensitisation. Explain how this procedure could be used to help Tommy overcome his phobia. Um, so firstly, it's probably worth us starting by recapping the sort of key components of what systematic desensitisation is. Okay? So there are three critical components to systematic desensitisation. The first one is relaxation training. We train the person, we use breathing techniques to help them be able to relax themselves when they're stressed or anxious. 
The second one, and really, really important, is we build something called a fear hierarchy. We list the behaviours from sort of the least fearful to the most fearful and trying to think about different situations that we can sort of build up to. So I've given actually an example here and applied it to Tommy anyway. Uh, for him, thinking about a bird, he might rate it as a 10 out of 100. Looking at a photo of a bird might be 20. Looking at a bird in a real cage might be 30. Holding a bird cage might be 50. Holding a bird itself, 75. And standing inside a bird enclosure might be 100. So you can see how they're getting worse and worse for someone with that fear. So developing a fear hierarchy is step two, and you do that often with your therapist. Uh, three is then the exposure. You expose the person to their fear hierarchy, starting at the bottom, working your way up. And the key is that by the time they get to the top, they should be cured of their fear. OK, let's put that back into sort of the context of that question. So we're going back to Tommy. The question was, explain how, use, sorry, a psychologist suggested treating Tommy's phobia of birds using systematic desensitisation. Explain how this procedure could have occurred to help him overcome this phobia. So we now just need to put those three key elements into practice and explain how they would occur for Tommy himself. So it starts with the relaxation training. So there's not a lot we can quote from the extract here. So here we've got to be a bit more inventive. So Tommy would be taught relaxation techniques that he could use when he encounters birds as part of his therapy. OK, we then move on. He has to develop a fear hierarchy. So Tommy would then create a fear hierarchy, starting with the least feared situation. Here I'm going to make something up, seeing a picture of a bird, going up to the most feared, standing inside a bird enclosure. So that's where we had to invent a bit more. This is a different type of AO2 skill. Last but not least, we're going to expose him to his fear, OK? Tommy would then be exposed to birds gradually, ensuring that he's relaxed at each stage. Now, that would be enough again to get us into that top mark band. We've clearly applied. We've given our examples. Let's imagine now that that question was actually worth six marks. This wouldn't be enough. So therefore, we're going to want one more key term if this was a six mark question. There is a key term called reciprocal inhibition, which is really, really interesting. And it's the idea that we can't experience two different emotional states at exactly the same time. So a, curse, a person can't be relaxed and uh, scared or anxious at exactly the same time. So the argument is that if we teach someone relaxation training, that relaxation should overtake their fear because we can't experience the two things at exactly the same time. So if this was a six marker, I would throw in the idea that systematic desensitization works on an idea of reciprocal inhibition. And that's the idea that we can't experience two emotional states at the same time. So eventually the relaxation will overcome the fear and the anxiety. Brilliant. Uh, same again for depression. Uh, there's a lot more in depression, unfortunately, it's a much longer word, um, but just a way to help you remember some of the key sort of symptoms and characteristics that go with depression. So the most important one, of course, is a depressed mood. That's an emotional symptom, a lack of energy, a behavioral symptom, a lack of pleasure in everyday life, an emotional symptom. People have a reduced feeling of self-worth. They feel worthless. That's an emotional symptom. Eating, so there's a changing appetite. Sleeping, there's a change in sleep, both behavioural characteristics. Sadness or feelings of sadness, that's obviously an emotion that goes with it. Inability to concentrate, that's a cognitive characteristic. Occasional suicidal thoughts, not all people with depression get this, so it's occasional in some people. And negative thoughts, so just different symptoms that you could use. This might help you just remember the key different ones. Moving on, I want to move on to an economy question now, OK, uh, because we are due to have one economy question in either of the papers and it didn't come up in paper one, so there's a good chance it could come up in paper two. Let's imagine we get the following question. Briefly explain how the findings of psychological research into treating depression could have implications for the economy. Only a two marker could be up to a four marker. Now, we covered this in the very first webinar on social psychology, and fortunately, the question is exactly the same. The points are exactly the same. So I mentioned previously that we could think about the reduced burden or cost on the NHS and reducing absenteeism. And that was a different question, yet the ideas are exactly the same in this one. Let me give you a couple of examples. If it was a two marker, I'd start by sort of outlining my question. If psychological research can find an effective treatment to things like depression, it could save the economy money because... And here's where we're going to pick up a couple of marks. It could reduce absenteeism, OK, the number of days off work, that should say not off work, which saves the government and employers money and improves productivity. It makes people work harder and smarter. Or, or if this was a four mark, you'd want both. It reduces the cost to the NHS because patients will no longer be prescribed drugs, which cost the NHS more money in the long term, allowing the NHS to spend more money on the treatment of other conditions. So you'll see there, that's how we'd pick up four marks if this was a four mark question. So those two key ideas, reducing the cost on the NHS and reducing absenteeism, apply to a question in this topic as well. So I think they're really key ideas just to keep in the back of your mind. Last but not least, OK, we're going to look at the psychopathology essays, of which there are six of them. But we're going to look at three in particular today because yesterday we actually covered uh, the other three that we need. OK, so there are six different essays OK, and they're on screen now. 
So for every one of the approaches, behavioural, cognitive and biological, you can either be asked to explain the formation of phobias or the treatment of phobias. Explain the formation of depression, explain the treatments of depression, or explain the uh, formation of OCD or the treatment of OCD. Now yesterday we did a lot of work on the explanations one, so actually today I want to turn our attention to looking at the treatments essay. Okay? What you'll be provided with after this session is a, a large handout, you can print this A3 or A4, where you can actually condense all of the ideas down on just the two sides. So you can have all six essays planned out on two sides and it's a really useful tool that will help you with your revision to condense all of that learning down just into two sides so you've got all the key information you need. I'm going to do one of them for you and then you can use the handout to apply the ideas from today's session to the other two. So I'm going to pick the hardest one for you. I'm going to be quite kind today. I'm going to look at outline and evaluate the biological treatment of OCD for 12 marks. Okay, so I've picked the difficult one. Um, the first thing is, in terms of AO1, you want to sort of acknowledge the fact that the point of biological treatments is to redress the issue with biological abnormalities or biochemical imbalances. And the two drugs that psychologists use or psychiatrists use to treat OCD are anti-anxiety drugs and antidepressants. So interestingly, they use other drugs to treat OCD. Let's take the first one, which is the most complicated, okay, and that's benzodiazepines. Quite a lot to say here, but actually it's good to sort of try and memorise this because it is biology, just learning this exactly as it is. So benzodiazepines are a range of anti-anxiety drugs which include tra trade names like Valium Diazepam. Uh, the way they work is by enhancing the action of a neurotransmitter called GABA. Don't worry about what it stands for. GABA tells neurons in the brain to slow down and stop firing, which means that Benzodiazepines actually quiet the brain down a little bit, which means they reduce anxiety. Now, it's really important to then link that in to OCD. Um, anxiety is experienced as a result of the obsessive thoughts, so therefore what these drugs are doing is reducing that anxiety associated with obsessive thoughts. Sadly, because the question is biological treatments, one wouldn't be enough, so we need to mention a second one, and the second one is much easier. So we could say that SSRIs, which are a range of antidepressants, um, include drugs like Prozac, they work by increasing the level of serotonin in the synapse and therefore there's more serotonin being received by the receiving cell which reduces the symptoms of OCD because we reduce the sort of depressive symptoms. That would therefore be enough to get you into the top mark there. I now want to turn our attention to evaluation and I'm going to give you four points that you could use pretty much in any one of these essays and they're four really sort of golden sort of nugget points that you can use anywhere. Okay, so let's take one of these to begin with. Let's look at the idea of side effects, and this can apply to all of the different treatments. You can even say they have side effects or they don't. So in terms of drugs, we'd say one criticism of the biological treatment of OCD is the potential of side effects. Okay, Some drugs, like SSRIs, have mild side effects like indigestion, uh, whereas other people get more serious side effects like hallucination. Benzodiazepines, which used to be called the chill pill, are really addictive drugs. Now, why is this a problem? Well, it matters because these side effects actually reduce the effectiveness of the drug treatment because often people will stop taking their drugs if they get the side effects and therefore they're going to relapse. So that's how you do side effects. Let's pick a different one. Um, are they cost effective? A strength of biological treatments for OCD is their cost. Simple as that. Biological treatments, including antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs, are relatively cost effective, especially in the short term, in comparison to psychological treatments like cognitive behavioural therapy. Why does that matter? Well, it's beneficial for health service providers who can offer more treatments as money is saved with other biological treatments for OCD. So there's your second one. Last but not least, can it, does it treat the cause or the symptoms? Is it a limited treatment or is it actually a very good treatment? That's what we're getting at here. And I'll do the last one for you. One criticism of drug treatments for OCD is that they actually only treat the symptoms and not the cause. Uh, biological treatments, including antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs, all they do is reduce the symptoms associated with OCD, or the anxiety or the depression, and they don't actually cure the person of their OCD. Now, why does this matter? Well, because if the person stops taking the drugs, there's a good chance they're going to relapse and their OCD returns. So we've not solved the problem at all. And there we have it. These four points, and I'll let you play around with those, can be used for all of these different treatments. So they're a sort of great sort of way to sort of save time and just learn these four points and just know how they apply to those different treatments. And I'll let you complete the handout applying the ideas from today's session. That is it for today. So as usual, any questions, feel free to drop us an email or uh, send us a tweet at tutor to you psych. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in the last of the sessions tomorrow on research methods. Thank you.